This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Have you ever seen somebody spewing a bunch of nonsense and thought to yourself, that person is full of crap? It's a phrase that I've used all my life without even really thinking about it, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. But the other day it occurred to me that to say someone is full of crap isn't just an insult, it's a measurement. Like, I know what full means in terms of a cup. It's eight ounces. If I have eight ounces of a thing, I have a cup of that thing. I know what it means to have a mole of something. A mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of anything. If I have around 600 sextillion of a thing, I have around a mole of that thing. But what does it actually mean to say that someone is full of crap? I can't say that somebody is full if full has no meaning. I know that I need exactly 12 of something to have a dozen. I can't have 11, I can't have 13, I have to have 12 for it to be a dozen. So how many or how much of something do I need to have in order to have one human crapful? So today we are going to be answering the age old question that people across generations have been asking without even realizing it, exactly how full of crap can a person actually, literally, scientifically be? Unfortunately, answering this question isn't quite as easy as just asking it. In fact, as I began to develop the answer to this question, I came across several complications that are gonna need to be addressed. And to know what I mean by that, we need to first understand the setting. If we're going to talk about poop, we first need to understand what is poop, and where is poop, and possibly most importantly, why is poop? And we can start answering all of these questions by taking a brief tour of the digestive system. Your gastrointestinal, or GI tract, is a hollow tube that runs from your mouth to your anus. It's basically like a silly straw that penetrates your head and torso. You know that whole debate over whether a drinking straw has one hole or two because both sides are connected? Like that, only with your entire body. Are your mouth and your butthole really different holes considering the fact that they're just two sides of the same pipe? Basically what I'm saying is humans are tubes and not enough people think about that. Now there are two major ways to divide up your GI tract. The simple way is to divide it into two parts, upper GI and lower GI. I'll tell you the more complicated way later after we've identified all the structures, but for now, let's just stick with the upper GI tract, which consists of your mouth, your esophagus, and your stomach. Food enters the mouth, or oral cavity, where it's broken down through a process called mastication, or as you might call it, chewing. I'll give you a few seconds to giggle about the word mastication, and now we're moving on. While you may not usually think of it this way, mastication is actually the first stage of digestion. Because not only are you mechanically breaking down your food by chewing it, you're also chemically breaking it down with enzymes in your saliva, like amylase, which breaks starches down into sugars, or lingual lipase, which breaks down fats. Saliva is mainly made in three pairs of salivary glands. Your parotid glands, which are just in front of your ears, your submandibular glands, which are just under and behind your mandible, and your sublingual glands, which are just under your tongue. However, you also have lots of smaller glands that line your mouth and throat and help keep things slippery. While these major salivary glands range in size from around the size of an almond to around the size of your ear, these smaller accessory glands all around your mouth and throat are only a couple of millimeters in size. Also, fun fact, the average adult human produces between one to two liters of saliva a day. That's over half a gallon of spit, y'all. The masticated food, lubricated by saliva, then moves as one mass, or bolus, through your esophagus and into your stomach through a process called peristalsis. Peristalsis is the involuntary wave-like contractions of smooth muscles that push things through your internal organs. It's not just how food gets from your mouth to your stomach, it's also how it's going to get through your stomach and through your intestines as well. As soon as that food hits your stomach, you've got, on average, around six to eight hours before it's officially made into poop. But a lot of things happen in that time. For example, while the food is in your stomach, those same peristaltic contractions are going to further mechanically break it down, while strong acids and enzymes are going to break it down chemically as well. And not only is that important for breaking your food down to a molecular level so you can absorb it properly, it also creates a hazardous environment for any pathogens that may have hitched a ride on your food. It's weird to think of your stomach as a defense mechanism, but it absolutely is. After a couple of hours of being ground up and dissolved, the food in your stomach has become a thick, soupy paste that we call chyme. 
and that chyme now needs to move out of your stomach into your small intestine through a valve at the bottom of your stomach called the pyloric sphincter. Oh, did you think the word sphincter just referred to your anus? No, you've got sphincters all throughout your body. In just your GI tract alone, you've got your lower esophageal sphincter that leads to your stomach, you've got your ileocecal sphincter that connects your small intestine to your large intestine, and even just your anus actually has two sphincters, one internal and one external. But the pyloric sphincter is what connects the stomach to the small intestine. And this is where things start to get a little bit tricky for the question of how full of crap a person can actually be. Because this is where we need to start thinking about exactly where and how food becomes feces. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that we can all agree that food is not poop when it's in your mouth, and chyme is not poop when it's in your stomach. But as soon as chyme reaches the small intestine, poop is imminent. The small intestine is the beginning of your lower GI tract, which also consists of your large intestine, your rectum, and your anus. The main function of your small intestine is to absorb nutrients from the chyme into your bloodstream. And it does this largely the same way that your lungs absorb oxygen, by diffusing these molecules across a super thin layer of tissue into the tiny blood vessels directly underneath. Because absorption happens this way, surface area is key. If your small intestine was just a smooth surface, your chyme would either have to sit in one place for a very long time, or your small intestine would have to be about a mile long in order for you to properly absorb all the nutrients from it. But instead, just as your lungs are packed with tiny little air sacs called alveoli, which increase their surface area, your small intestine is lined with little finger-like projections called villi, each one of which is packed full of capillaries, drastically increasing the surface area over which chyme can pass and nutrients can be absorbed. In fact, all those villi and their associated microvilli, the even tinier fingers that line the tiny fingers, amplify the surface area of the inside of your small intestine around 60 to 120 times, bringing it up to a total of around 30 square meters or 322 square feet of tissue. That's the size of a one-car garage. But this absorption doesn't happen equally throughout the entire small intestine. In fact, your small intestine is divided into three different parts. The duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Each of which has a different length and a different function. The duodenum is the shortest section, measuring in at around 25 centimeters or 10 inches in length. Its main job is really just to move chyme out of the stomach and to neutralize stomach acid, although a little more chemical digestion does happen here. The pancreas secretes pancreatic enzymes into the duodenum, which further digestion, and the liver and gallbladder secrete bile into the duodenum, which not only helps break down fats, but also contributes to the color of your poop, as it starts out green, but gets chemically broken down by bacteria in your large intestine until it turns brown. The next part of your small intestine is the jejunum. It's around two and a half meters or eight feet long, and it's responsible for most of the nutrient absorption. This is where you absorb sugars and amino acids and fatty acids and much, much more. And then finally, the ileum is the last and longest section of your small intestine, measuring it at three meters or around 10 feet long. This is where you absorb any remaining nutrients the jejunum might have missed, as well as bile acids which your body can recycle. The small intestine connects to the large intestine at the ileocecal junction, named for the ileum, and this small pouch at the base of the large intestine called the cecum. And you might think that this is where poop occurs. This is the threshold across which all is poop, but it's really not that simple. In fact, this junction is just the tip of the poop iceberg, the poopberg, if you will. You see, your large intestine, otherwise known as your colon, is made up of five parts. There's the cecum, which we've already mentioned, which is about six centimeters or two inches long, the ascending colon, which is about 20 centimeters or eight inches long, the transverse colon, which is about 45 centimeters or 18 inches long, the descending colon, which is about 30 centimeters or 12 inches long, and the sigmoid colon, which is about 45 centimeters or 18 inches long. This connects to your rectum, which is about 15 centimeters or six inches long. The last few centimeters of the rectum is called the anal canal, and the whole thing ends at your anus, which is the boundary of where your GI tract and our calculation ends. By the way, remember at the beginning when I said I'd tell you the more complicated way to divide up your GI tract once we identified all the parts? Well, we just did. So you can also divide up your GI tract into three parts based on where they get their blood supply. The foregut is everything from the esophagus to about midway through the duodenum, and it's all supplied by the celiac trunk. 
The midgut is everything from midway through the duodenum to the first half of the transverse colon, and it's all supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. And then there's the hindgut, which is everything from the last half of the transverse colon down to the anal canal, all of which is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. Now you'll notice I didn't mention either your mouth or your anus there because those have their own independent arterial supplies, which is why I didn't use this system for this video. But it's still lots of fun because it gets you thinking about how your guts work and that makes me very happy. Oh, and one other thing about intestines before we move on. If you take a good look at your large intestine, you'll notice that it's segmented like a big worm. Those segments are called haustra. And as each individual haustrum becomes full of feces, it reflexively squeezes and pushes everything into the next haustrum down the line to keep things flowing smoothly. And that's just so weird to think about how they each have their own reflexes. It totally freaks me out, man. I love it. Now the main function of the large intestine is to absorb all of the excess water from the waste that your body is about to expel, turning it into a solid mass that we commonly call poop. So if a student were to walk up to me and just casually ask what is poop, I would probably say something along the lines of, it's the waste from the chyme after your small intestine has absorbed all the nutrients and your large intestine has absorbed all the water, poop is whatever's left. But are you seriously going to tell me that diarrhea isn't poop because it still has a bunch of water in it so it wasn't properly processed by the large intestine? And even if we eliminated the large intestine entirely, even if we completely cut out that organ and found another way to stay properly hydrated, I can tell you from experience, the stuff that comes out of your small intestine isn't great. If you were to encounter some of it, you'd treat it like poop. And herein lies the crux of the question. This is why we had to do a complete review of the entire digestive system in order to answer the question of how full of crap a person can actually be. Because if anybody is going to take an issue with my calculations, this is where the issue is going to be, is what is poop, and where is poop, and why is poop? Is chyme poop the second that it reaches your small intestine, or does it become poop as the nutrients are absorbed somewhere in the middle? Is poop only in your large intestine? And if so, where in the large intestine? Is it right at the beginning, or is it somewhere between the transverse colon and the rectum? What if you have like an ostomy bag or something and the poop doesn't get all the way through your large intestine? Is it still poop? If so, why? Where is the threshold of poop? And is the threshold of poop a physical, tangible thing, or is it more like a philosophical, metaphorical thing? And even if we're just thinking about things that we can all agree are poop, that's not to say that that poop couldn't end up somewhere else. If you have a significant enough bowel obstruction, feces can back up in your GI tract to the point where you are vomiting poop. And that's just an obstruction. In the case of a perforation, we could be calculating your entire abdominal cavity as potential space for poop. And see, that's another problem. How full of crap can a person actually be and how full of crap can a person actually be and survive are two very different questions. And that's why I had to make this whole video. That's why I couldn't just measure the average dimensions of the large intestine and answer this question in a silly post on threads. The question of how full of crap can a person be bears with it several necessary clarifying questions. Does crap accumulation have to be a natural process? Can it be inserted? Can it be injected? Can crap retention be mechanically aided? You have sinuses all through your face. Does it count if the crap is being inserted in a place where it normally naturally wouldn't be able to be deposited? So in order to address this question appropriately and answer it definitively, I had to define some terms and lay down some parameters because otherwise I'd have to calculate the total combined volume of your whole circulatory system and every cavity in the entire human body. Nature abhors a vacuum and the human body is, if not Nothing else, a vacuum for poop. So now that we understand the finer details of the digestive system, let's lay down our methodology and answer this question once and for all. In order to calculate approximately how full of crap a person can actually be, I'm going to combine the total internal volumes of the entire large intestine, including the rectum, and the ileum of the small intestine, as that's where most nutrients have already been absorbed by the jejunum, so what's there is mainly just waste and water. I'm also going to take into consideration the fact that when we say someone is full of crap, that person is usually alive and not currently experiencing a bowel-related medical emergency. So all of these structures will be measured at their maximum capacity, but under conditions that are not otherwise considered clinically significant. That is to say, normal conditions which are extremely abnormal. 
Also, in order to account for the fact that intestines normally stretch and contract, we're just going to be using the average diameter of each of these organs and assuming, again, that none of this is of any clinical importance, so no part of these organs is overstretched. I'm also not including any gas in this mix because gas isn't poop. In fact, it's not even made by you. It's made by the bacteria that live in your guts and eat the things that you didn't digest. For example, cellulose is the chemical that makes the cell walls of plants and you lack the enzymes to break it down. But the little buddies that you got living in your guts can do it just fine. So when you eat a salad, they eat it again and then you fart out their waste. On average, every adult human makes somewhere between about a half a liter to about two liters of gas a day. And that could seriously throw off our measurements if we're just talking about poop. So for this video, we're gonna assume that this hypothetical, very poopful person doesn't have a fart to their name. With these parameters in mind, the total volume of poop that we're gonna come up with is lower than it probably could be, but it still stands to reason that no person would almost certainly ever have this much poop in their body. By using population averages for humans, we can calculate the internal volume of the intestines by using simple geometry. The volume of a cylinder is pi times length times radius squared. Now the walls of the intestines are a few millimeters thick, and that can add up and throw off our measurements, but we can assume that if the intestines are completely packed full of feces, they would be stretched a little bit to make that difference negligible at best. With that in mind, I already covered the average lengths of all the different parts of the intestines, so now all we need is their average diameters, which just so happen to be 2.5 centimeters, or about an inch for the small intestine, and 4.8 centimeters, or about 2 inches for the large intestine. And using those numbers, our calculations come out to approximately 3,674.36 cubic centimeters for the ilium, 216.77 cubic centimeters for the cecum, 1,445.23 cubic centimeters for the ascending colon, 3,254.14 cubic centimeters for the transverse colon, 2,169.43 cubic centimeters for the descending colon, 3,254.14 cubic centimeters for the sigmoid colon, and 1,084.71 cubic centimeters for the rectum, including the anal canal. All of which combines for a grand total of 15,198.78 cubic centimeters. That's about 15.2 liters, or almost exactly four gallons. As for the weight of all that, that depends on density, and that's an entirely different conversation. And there you have it, the average person at maximum crap capacity, or you guessed it, crapacity, is full of four gallons of poop. So next time you find yourself in possession of four gallons of something, I hope you remember exactly what that measurement means. Eight ounces is a cup, two cups is a pint, eight pints is a gallon, and four gallons is one human crapful. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts, have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye. And now, a word from our sponsor. If you're a fan of my work, there's a good chance that you like learning weird new things. And if that's the case, then Brilliant is a fantastic app for you to consider. Brilliant is an everyday learning app that allows you to explore real topics in math and science with fun, interactive lessons right in the palm of your hand. But it's not just the lessons themselves that are important. It's what that kind of learning does for you. Using an app like Brilliant helps you develop problem solving and critical thinking skills while developing a habit of learning something new every single day. And the best part is they're offering my subscribers a chance to try Brilliant absolutely free for a full 30 days plus 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium just by using the link down in the description or going to brilliant.org slash whether you're a new learner or a professional who wants to keep their mind sharp, Brilliant is a fantastic app to explore new concepts and learn new cool things. As for me, I encourage everyone to try their scientific thinking lessons so that they can familiarize themselves with the beautiful intricacies of the world around them. So get started today by going to brilliant.org slash Remember, you get to try Brilliant Premium absolutely free for a full 30 days and you get 20% off an annual subscription. It's an affordable and easy way to start exploring the world of science on your own terms. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thanks so much to you for watching this video. Thanks so much to my patrons on Patreon. Have an awesome rest of your day and never stop learning. Bye-bye.